Hello and welcome to South Asia Chat, a podcast series brought to you by the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. I'm your host, Nitya Subramanian, an editor here. On 19th November 2021, the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced his government's decision to repeal the three controversial farm laws. The Farmers Produce Trade and Commerce Promotion and Facilitation Act 2020, the Farmers Empowerment and Protection Act on Price Assurance and Farm Services Act 2020, and the Essential Commodities Amendment Act 2020, which were legislated by the Indian Parliament last year. The enactment of these laws had led to year-long protests by farmers from Punjab and Western Uttar Pradesh. But the sudden announcement to repeal these laws on Guru Purab this year, a day sacred to the Sikhs, has led to various questions. To throw more light on this, we have with us Mr. Shubhamoy Bhattacharji, Senior Adjunct Fellow at RIS India, as well as Consulting Editor, Business Standard. Thank you for joining us today, Shubhamoy. Thank you, Nitya. In September 2020, the government introduced three bills seeking amendments to the existing farm laws. These were seen as progressive steps. However, it led to year-long protests. And finally, in November 2021, Prime Minister Modi announced the withdrawal of these legislations. These were also repealed on the first day of the winter session of parliament. Could you share some background on these legislations and what led to the widespread protests of farmers, mainly from Punjab and Western Uttar Pradesh? Uh, that's an interesting position that, uh, in fact, lots of people are still trying to figure out that why did the farmers protest? Uh, because this was uh, the, if we leave out the Essential Commodities Act, which was a different one, the other two were essentially some things which the farming community has been batting for a long time. Uh, in fact, the fact that the farmers are not getting remunerative prices, that farming has got a problem on investment, that farming essentially the terms of trade vis-a-vis -vis industry has been extremely uncomfortable for several decades is something that is nothing new. And this has been gone into by so many committees and each one has more or less come to the conclusion that you needed two things to be done. One was that the farmers needed to get a better price for whatever they produced. And the way to get that better price was to expand the bouquet of opportunities that the farmers have in their ability to sell the products because the farmer was getting some support from the government but obviously farming is not some it's not a collective farming it's not a communist farming in so if it's a private enterprise then there needs to be market discovery so farmers should get the ability to discover the prices that was first thing the second was that commensurately the state and also those who would buy from the farms uh, whether it's private enterprise or public sector companies run by the government or anybody else would be invested then in raising productivity of the farms because that would help them. So overall, this was something which um, led to a model act of 2017. We'll talk about that later, which was agreed to, which was, uh, I mean, welcomed by everyone. So the breakout of the agitation was actually rather surprising from the economic point of view. Yes, Nitya. Um, so, so when we talk about these laws being, um, being progressive and being good for the farmers, do you think this is a step backwards to farm reforms in India? Well, certainly, I mean, the, but that everyone is agreed upon, even though there are uh, some commentators trying to say that, you know, it was, I mean, they're trying to sort of capture two things. They're cap trying to capture the political process with the economic logic and saying that even though it may be have been sound, it wasn't done the right way. We could come to that later. Mm -hmm. But the short point is that if we look at farming as, a, as, as an economic activity, it definitely needed these two things as we talked about, the price discovery and investment. 
and the farm laws whether it's passed by the state governments which is the sub national governments in india or by the center they both have to go in the same direction i mean they they this is the direction in which the farm laws had to the farming sector had to uh, be helped along remember one thing and that's a, that's an important point farming is not in india controlled by the by the government and this is something to be understood very well it's a private sector enterprise mm -hmm. so when we say a law it must be made clear that there can't be any government law that says how you produce something or how you sell something a law can only be there to create facilitating conditions to expand the bouquet of choices for the private entrepreneur so whether it's somebody running a shop whether it's somebody running an enterprise a factory or whether somebody who's running a farm essentially these are private sector enterprises so the state's role has to be only about allowing a larger bouquet of of, of opportunities and these laws that came along were framed on those lines that here are the opportunities that you have may i offer you something more so in principle as well as in practice it becomes very difficult to argue that why should this not be uh, clear to to a farmer except that as we said when political issues juxtapose get juxtaposed with the economic logic um, there has also been a lot of conversation about msp the minimum support price that is offered to farmers and uh, there is emphasis also that the land holdings by farmers are pretty small uh, we we are talking about small farmers here and this law would uh, would take away the msp and therefore hurt the small farmers that is one argument that the farming community has been putting forward but there is also the other side which uh, talks about diversification of uh, farming as in a lot of ground waters Uh, is uh, picked up in states where uh, rice is not traditionally a crop and uh, things like that so how do you think uh, these arguments work and what where, where do you stand on them that's these are interesting arguments and these have come up in the course of the farmers agitation hmm. and again uh, the point that becomes very clear is that uh, to take the exam issue of the msp the minimum support price now mm -hmm. we know that uh, it has been talked uh, the government of india and the state governments between them offer support price for about 23 crops remember here the state government's role is very important mm -hmm. the central government support price works only for couple of cereals and mm -hmm. sugar and uh, and and for couple of pulses the other support prices are given by the state it is the states which pick up these crops but here again the important thing to remember is that farming is a private sector enterprise mm. a farmer has to be able to pick up the best possible price now if you are saying that are we saying where do we then posit the msp does it act as a floor or as a ceiling ideally i would say it shouldn't be there because if the farmers are getting the price that they market offers then uh, which is a reasonable price then you shouldn't be needing an msp but assume but as since we know that the market is not uh, robust enough and mm -hmm. uh, the farmers are, are and large number of farmers as you pointed out are extremely uh, those with low holdings the issue that comes up is then are we say, then we are essentially saying that the msp is like not as a price support but like a universal basic income mm. that essentially a farmer must get a subsistence support now if that is the case then the argument goes on in a different direction altogether because if it is going to be a income support for the farmer for the poor farmer then obviously that's right and in that case then the why should the government at all the state or the center run the apparatus of msp if they could actually give a universal basic income to the people the farmers are there the agricultural laborers are there and as you know the central government has started the scheme of uh, income support to farmers 
And there are lots of uh, commentators who are rightly pointing out that possibly to ensure that consumption doesn't slip, uh, we should go in for a universal basic income to the extent of the state uh, can offer. Well, we can have a universal basic income. And if there's a basic income, then that's one can, I mean, the argument then goes along on different lines as to what should be the uh, basic level, what, how should it be administered. But then the immediate advantage that comes along is the state or the center is rid of the responsibility of having to pay for the cost of buying huge amounts of crop, which will necessarily become price sensitive. I mean, uh, MSP sensitive instead of being price sensitive. So to put it simply, it's much more cheap for a government to give out income support to a farmer and not bother what the farmer is doing with her or his enterprise. So if she's producing wheat or rice or anything else or pulses or anything, then that person is free to go around and to sell that wherever. The subconsumption level, the income level, the for the life support, which under the um, Indian constitution, we say the right to life should be provided for comes from the universal basic income. So then that's, that's, that's a far better, uh, I would say, application of a government's limited budget rather than the additional cost. And as you know, the National Food Security Act costs us about 143 trillion rupees a year. And that's just the maintenance cost on rice and wheat. Uh, why do we need to pay that? That money can then go for far more productive uh, uh, areas and farm opera and farm more application. Because what happens is when the government buys that rice under the NFSA, it also has to sell. I mean, the mandate is that it will be selling it only for two rupee or one rupee. And the, the entire process of doing that can actually be discarded by doing a universal basic income. So that's about the MSP issue if it is linked to issues about income security. The other issue you talked about was about whether the farm, whether there should be an investment in the sector, but we can take that up in the next segment. Um, I would now like to look at the politics of this decision. How do you view the withdrawal of the Modi government's, uh, the, the recent withdrawal announcement by the Modi government? Uh, do you believe it was politically motivated or as some people call it a win for democracy? Yeah, that's a, that's that that's a interesting issue, and uh, I think all said and done, there's no doubt about the fact that this was a large agitation. It went on for a long number of months, and the fact that uh, the government had to turn around to say that yes, um, we are sorry, we we'll, we are withdrawing the act. It definitely helps uh, the cause of uh, people's participation in a in a in an issue. And that there can be no um, in cavil about that. It definitely is is a, is a, is a useful uh, reminder again that in India, especially when we are looking around uh, its neighbors, uh, countries which uh, where even a raising of an issue is a difficult enterprise. Here, the very fact that the issue was raised, people were allowed to mobilize, and a government was had to accept that the more, that the demand of the people will be accepted is i think is i think is, is i think is a, is a very strong um, i mean a thumbs up for the democracy so there is no doubt about that the problem that comes along and this is the big problem is which you alluded to right at the beginning is about what happens to issues about factor reforms right from the beginning of the liberalization process in India in 1991, the three factors, land, labor, and capital, which the governments have tried to work on uh, to liberalize, have not met with success. The governments have succeeded with what is called product reforms. So there is today freedom for anybody to produce anything, to sell anything, and there are regulators in the market to ensure that the product is of the right quality 
that the price is of the right quality and the, both the producer as well as the consumer get a fair deal. But this situation does not apply for the factor markets. The land reform again came to an abortive end. And remember, land reform wasn't the first time. It was started during the UPA government during the course of the SZ agitation. Uh, that didn't, uh, that couldn't go through. The India government gave it, an, uh, gave it a push once again. They also had to backtrack. So essentially, land reforms um, is a very fraught exercise. And one of the reasons why manufacturing sector in India doesn't take off substantially is because of the fact that it's extremely difficult to get a piece of land. And no center or, or state government is willing to put its neck out to be able to get into that sort of an area. The same thing now happens here. You might say agriculture is not a factor, but agriculture has got a limited issue of the both land as well as labor. And this again buttresses the idea that doing anything vis-a-vis -vis land in India is practically, I mean, it has been proved now in as many colors as you want to fill in that you will not be able to do land reforms in India in the way that uh, it that the way we understand it, that a large mass of land is mobilized to set up a unit that will be impossible. You can do it in terms of individual buying and selling and that link of land is going along. So maybe there'll be more land rights that will be coming along. The government is working on the scheme called Swamitra, which means giving land titles to people in the villages and in any places uh, by, by uh, mapping the entire Indian subcontinent, uh, the Indian uh, uh, country. Um, so that, that is a process that is going along that, that will help hopefully in terms of people being able to sell individual parcels. But in terms of land being a factor which can be used by uh, an enterprise to, 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 to develop a um, unit, uh, that it has definitely uh, gone, I mean, uh, that, that has definitely been stopped for the time being. Um, and definite and and this would raise the issue of what happens with labor because labor reforms uh, for a government that is now uh, definitely with election seasons setting in uh, will be difficult one to talk about states will be leery about touching an issue which could show again mobilization and a very difficult uh, what you might call um, job of convincing people that labor reforms works. You, you picked up a few interesting points that I would like to um, take forward. One is that uh, you mentioned land and labor laws. Now, recently we did read some reports where unions are now demanding uh, repeal to the, land, to the labor laws. How do you think the government will be able to push through economic reforms if, as you said, state elections are also around the corner? You know, what will happen, Nithya, is that this will again reassert India's role as a service economy. So when we look at labor reforms, <clears throat> we shouldn't just be thinking of labor as, as a large mass of people going into a manufacturing unit. I mean, that problem, there will immediately be issues about whether those labor can be employed, redeployed, uh, and all those questions. But at the same time, India is also becoming a startup capital. And look at what these startups are doing. They are also picking up labor, and not just IT. They're also picking up labor from different sectors, uh, hospitals, like healthcare sector, low um, semi-trained uh, healthcare workers, uh, similar sort of cohorts in door-to-door uh, -door delivery. Uh, there are uh, labor who would be who are picking being picked up for transport services and all sorts of things. Now, why are those uh, looking much more possible? Because those do not lead to you know mass of labor coming in at one place. Even though there are efforts and there will be efforts which will continuously happen, what happens is the labor doesn't accumulate in one place like a factory floor. And when that doesn't happen, mobilization becomes a difficult exercise. 
for any union. So even hire and fire and all those issues also tends to become a difficult issue to mobilize because it because the most of the workers don't get uh, employed per se in the company. They become either I mean the companies usually pick up from the third parties or 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 put them up as partners. The point is that the labor essentially as a homogeneous mass doesn't stay. But that satisfies which sector? That satisfies the services sector. And it's not surprising that almost all, not just almost, every startup that is coming up is looking at the services sector. We are not seeing too much of a push for the manufacturing sector. There have been some, like for instance, Samsung setting up a mobile manufacturing center in near Delhi. Uh, in Tamil Nadu, for instance, there are lots of manufacturing units that are expanding the scope. Again, what's happened, what's going to happen is these workers, whether those in near uh, Delhi or those coming up near Tamil Nadu, will be migrant laborers. Now, they will not be that keen to be willing to be pushing up for, you know, uh, labor related rights and stuff. Essentially, that means that the bargaining power will be sort of uh, heavier towards the employer. And that is so essentially that means whenever labor is at its local place, there will be the startups which will be deploying them. Wherever labor has migrated, and I largely mean the Western and the Southern states, their labor will be much more amenable to mobilization in a factory. But in the labor but labor uh, to be mobilized say in a state like say madhya pradesh in uttar pradesh in bihar west bengal uh, it will be impossible and it becomes even more impossible in fact if you look at the states which have uh, passed labor law changes in through the state uh, laws through the state governments you'd find again it's basically the western and the southern states going forward what role do you think the state governments will play in pushing these reforms because there are many experts who are of the view that especially when it comes to farm reforms it is going to be the states that will now have to take the lead and do you believe that states like uttar pradesh and punjab would take the lead because they are they are as i as we mentioned earlier are in due for elections very soon uh, what are your thoughts on that you know, surprisingly, the states which will take their, and already the states which have taken their lead in agricultural reforms will again be the Western and the Southern states. Now, this might seem peculiar, but again, because of the fact that these are states which are becoming very urbanized, here, the market for agricultural products is visible to the farmer. There is also investment that is flowing very quickly to the farms. So the transaction is more transparent and more robust. Punjab, I think, is entering a very difficult period, and I suspect it's going to be uh, down, very downhill from now, because Punjab has depended exact on just on wheat and rice, and the demand for that has plateaued across India. And for Punjab to today turn it round to be able to provide any other crops is very difficult because you'll have to essentially bring in migrant laborers. And remember migrant laborers, at one stage, Punjab was the receptacle. Today, it isn't so. Uh, we saw photographs during COVID of, farmer, of farmers actually coaxing laborers from uh, the Eastern states to come to Punjab and work. Uh, you'll see more of that difficult situation happening more. Now, what does it mean? It means that for labor intensive crops, which require, which obviously as the word suggests, means more people, these farmers, the big farmers of Punjab will not be getting workers. So essentially <clears throat> agricultural reforms in these states, even if they try, it's, I don't expect them to be succeeding much. But agricultural reforms will, as you rightly pointed out, will be happening and is already happening in the Southern states and in the Western states. And there, the cash crops are taking over. The horticultural crops in India, where India is now the largest producer of horticultural crops in the world at 320 million, 321 million tons. <clears throat> those, uh, the demand for those is rising. The market for those is rising. 
with the uh, entry of uh, grocery and other uh, related uh, uh, startups in the market, the demand, uh, the, dem the demand for those is going to expand even further. So there, there will be lots of those changes that will come along. I suspect that with the end of this agitation, uh, the, these states will also have difficulty, not just the center, the North Indian states, especially those in the, the wheat and the rice uh, belt, they will not be willing to pick up any agricultural reform laws. They'll be very uncomfortable trying to do it. And that will actually push their agriculture to more in the, what I might call, uh, low, 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 low uh, equilibrium crap. And you would see more workers from there migrating to southern states. So we are, we are possibly going to see a huge dip in the, in the, in the, in the extent of farming in these states. I mean, the farming will stay, but the, but the productivity, which is already low in these states, will actually decline further. And the sub need for support of the rural economy in these states will, I mean, it'll, it'll, it'll transfer, it'll transmit in very interesting ways because you essentially will not be getting um, the enterprising uh, farmers, they're staying there because they'll be moving around to other states, the workers moving around to other states and the states themselves not having the, uh, the political will, these states, as I talk about. To do, do any substantial reforms there. So you are going to see a very interesting divide that will get accentuated between the northern and southern states. I wrote about this recently that it will essentially uh, mean that just as industry is getting very sharply divided, not just getting sharply divided, has got very sharply divided between the southern and the northern states, agriculture too will see a similar phenomenon. That's a very interesting note to end our conversation. So thank you very much for joining us at South Asia Chat. Thank you. Thank you, Nitya. You were listening to South Asia Chat. To learn more about our work, visit us at isas.nus.edu.sg. Also follow us on our social media handles, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Thank you. Mm -hmm.